medical records, I think most people in the country think they're fairly sacrosanct. They don't want you screwing with their medical records. The doctor made a wrong decision and the guy died. Then there was added to it all of this untruthfulness. How does that react to determining the dollar amounts once the jury has found somebody guilty? Hey, Rick Picotta, Greg Henry, and a special guest, Dr. Greg Moore, is going to conduct the February issue of uh, Risk Management Monthly 2018. Greg, welcome aboard. It's it's been a while since we've uh, we've chatted, and I know that you have accumulated a bunch of interesting cases. But before we get more specifically into the medical legal, tell us a little bit about your experience with that train wreck that uh, happened up there, where everybody was taken to Madigan. Uh, yeah, it was quite an experience. Uh, I happened to be on duty that day at 9 a.m. Uh, when I came in, it was pretty much all settled down, but I got to see what was happening and how things went, and uh, it was pretty impressive. It was a very tragic thing for the people on the train, but uh, our hospital, Madigan Army Medical Center, we took 20 of the patients. Uh, two or three of them were seriously ill, and uh, we were always being told by one of our colleagues that something like this would happen someday, and it did. And I was very pleasantly surprised with uh, how smooth and well it went. Um, one thing that makes things go well with these disasters is the time of the day, actually. And this occurred on a morning where everybody was at work and able to help, and there was a tremendous response from you know all departments of the hospital. You know, while we're commenting on this sort of thing, uh, our good colleagues in Las Vegas really had stress with that uh, shooting. And if you've read about it in EP Monthly and various other uh, magazines, um, they seem to get through it pretty well. And, you know, we work with some pretty terrific people. And it's it's fair to say none of them were looking at their watch saying, I got to go home now. Uh, this is what we expect out of professionals, and I'm glad they all came through. Well, what's refreshing, uh, now I've seen it firsthand, is guys that you normally wouldn't give the time of day to and them vice versa because of whatever specialty or whatever relationship you have, all band and come together and do the greater good. And that that's kind of encouraging and refreshing to witness. Yeah, you know, uh, the same thing is happening here. Uh, to a certain degree, because I don't know whether it's happening where you are, but the newspapers are full of the fact that uh, their flu is inundating these hospitals uh, locally. Uh, one of my one of the ladies who works with me, uh, she is on dialysis and uh, she was uh, sick and she went to the local ER. She was going to be admitted and she was in the emergency department for four days four days before she got to bed. And this happened like two weeks ago. This is not like ancient history. Uh, so they are basically very, very uh, stressed down here regarding the flu. Greg, uh, you have a series of cases, some of them very <laughs> provocative to say the least. Do you want to start out on, uh, on going through these and then Greg and I will hop in when we have something erudite to say? Yeah, we're going to do the best we can, but, you know, he's one of those fancy MD, JD, PhD, BFD guys that uh, he's got a lot of stuff here. So uh, put up with us, put up with us, Greg Moore, and we'll do the best we can. Okay. Yes, I, I was uh, I was not uh, um, adequate in my introduction. Greg is an MD, JD, and uh, has been with us in the past a number of times, goes a and uh, has written articles that have been published in the literature regarding a variety of aspects of risk management related kinds of things. And I also have to do, we have to do, Greg, a shout out to Joe Littner and Maria Hugi, who are good friends and who have worked at Madigan for a really uh, long time. Unfortunately, we don't uh, have courses up in uh, Whistler anymore where they were regulars. Yes. They were regulars up there. And when I was up at Madigan, uh, of course, I got to, uh, as a visiting prof, I got to see them. We went on, uh, went down, had dinner together, and they have been long standing 
supporters of Risk Management Monthly. So hi to you guys, and uh, we're glad we got one of your compatriots here on the show. Greg, take it away. Well, uh, I've gathered a bunch of cases and actually uh, done a lecture on this recently about uh, kind of liability when you are not a professional. Uh, it's centered on professionalism and and basically professionalism is worth its weight in gold and we'll see that. Um, and that that's kind of what I brought here today. And a lot of these cases you're going to say, oh my gosh, I would never do that. Who would do that? That's stupid. Anybody knows better than that. I, I kind of tallied the other day and I've been involved in training over 300 residents. And I would tell you that I know of 10 to 15 that have already been snagged by these issues that we're going to talk about. Um, but let me lead into the first case. It's called Babadu versus Jackson in Texas. And this kind of centers on confidentiality. I, I know you guys down in Los Angeles have had employees that have had problems with that when celebrities go into hospitals and you access their records. Yes, we are the uh, center, uh, center of uh, medical Confidential, uh, con confidentiality access uh, focused on Cedar sinai Medical Center and uh, St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica, the hospitals where all the stars go. And there's been all of these repeated people who have accessed records inappropriately. <laughs> they have a zero tolerance policy here. You don't, you're out. The first time you do that, you're out. <laughs> right, exactly. And I, you know, I was involved in a conference out in uh, Southern California in which four or five hospitals did present their cases. And there is no question about the fact that if you have an employee who can pick up 30, 40 grand from, TMZ or one of those places turning things in, they'll do it. This They really are giving out information on a need-to-know basis only, and uh, I'm glad I don't have all those problems here in the Midwest. There's nobody famous in the Midwest. That's just <laughs> the way we are. Okay, well, let me. Uh, I'll do two quick back-to-back -back cases. One is uh, Babadu versus Jackson in Texas. And this was a patient who was in a VA medical center rehab program, and he ha uh, had a relationship with an employee that worked in the communication center. And she texted him and asked him how the drug rehab was going. And he realized that she'd accessed his medical records without his permission. And investigation real uh, kind of revealed that she had used a hospital computer to do this. And so he litigated and said, you know, you invaded my privacy. Uh, because of our relationship and not because it was a work-related matter. And um, he received an award from her of $35,000. Then there was a, a more impressive one here, Ninchi versus Peterson and Walgreen Drugs in Indiana. And in this one, a woman had a prescription filled, and the pharmacist was married. Her husband had previously had a relationship with the woman who got the prescription filled. The pharmacist accessed that woman's prior prescription history because uh, she was suspicious that the woman had given her husband a sexually transmitted disease at one point. She then told her husband about the prescription past. The husband then texted the former girlfriend and asked her about the prescription past, which then alerted uh, the former girlfriend that they had accessed her records without her permission. Oh, oh, my God, Greg, Dr. Moore, this sounds like an episode on the Dr. Phil show. Yeah. I mean, this is this is incredible that people are doing this. I mean, if there's one thing we can say to the listeners, don't you ever do anything like that? Because it's not. Tell us how badly this went, Greg. Well, uh, just uh, that's the thing, Greg, is uh, a lot of these cases, you go, what an idiot. You would never do that. But I see it over and over, and especially even among people that I know. But this one uh, went to trial, and there was a jury verdict for $1.8 million. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's better off to wonder who may, who may have given your husband something than to actually look it up. And uh, this is uh, th this is actually hilarious. I mean, could could we do this from our uh, from the emergency departments or any place in the hospital? Yeah, we could. 
But you know what? Medical records, I think most people in the country think they're fairly sacrosanct. They don't want you screwing with their medical records. They really don't. But I think we've all been on duty sometime when maybe the CEO of the hospital or someone who's <laughs> uh, a co-worker even comes in. And um, from these kind of cases, I just fight that temptation to look at their x-ray or or do anything involving their medical records. And like, again, I will, I will emphasize it seems obvious, happens over and over and over. Yes, no, obvious is what lawsuits are made out of. And, uh, and, and, and the jury says the same thing to themselves. You know, what, what were you thinking, guy? Why did you do that? Yeah. Okay, Greg, I see something down here about some, some really nasty settlements. Um, what is this, $190 million? Yeah, I think that was uh, basically out of a, you know, I don't have the actual, uh, that actually wasn't a court case, but uh, I think it was three or four years ago. It was John Hopkins. There was a um, gynecologist on staff there that was taking pictures of uh, perineums uh, while he was doing exams and he had just a, a boatload of them on his computer and was found out. And, uh, the hospital, John Hopkins ended up settling for $190 million. The physician himself ended up committing suicide after this hit the press. Yeah, this was a, as I remember, Greg, this was a sort of a class action group. This isn't one person. This was that group of people who yeah. uh, who had their rights violated. Um, and, you know, all, all of us, particularly those people in teaching hospitals, we take pictures all the time. So I'm sure you're going to have some suggestions for us uh, when we get into the picture-taking business. Well, you know, I thought this was an interesting case because there were 7,000 7, patients involved. So this obviously has went on for a long time. I, I, you know, it strikes me, why would anybody take 7,000 pictures of a perineum? Aren't they pretty much all looking the same? <laughs> <laughs> Rick, you've entered into dangerous territory here. I mean, come but, on. Uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's what Harvey Weinstein said, too. How much variability and, can there be? You know? All right. right yeah. Exactly. But I think in general, uh, if you're going to be taking yeah. pictures, you better have control of it. You know where it goes, where it's stored. I, I remember the older days when we we had Polaroid cameras in the department. We'd take pictures, sign them, seal them, put them in envelopes, and attach them to the chart. We did this particularly in, in uh, police cases. Uh, but then we didn't have anything on our cell phone or a hospital phone or something like that. There wasn't multiple copies. There's one. So, uh, uh, Greg, what do you think about this? I mean, should we be putting these pictures we take for educational purposes on our phone? Should it be a hospital instrument? What should we be doing? Well, uh, it's, it's interesting, but a lot of hospitals now have developed kind of bylaws that forbid you using a personal camera or a cell phone to take a picture that it has to be a hospital one. I personally uh, use my cell phone a lot, especially with consultants. I take a picture of a rash or an eye, and then I text it to the consultant uh, where from home they can give me a better opinion. But I always make sure that the patient understands that I'm doing that and um, get their permission and then come back after I'm done and show them that I'm deleting the photo. Uh, yeah, that sounds to me like a very reasonable thing to do. Uh, people running around. I know we had a problem with an orthopod who had a lot of fractures sent to him. Uh, and these were just on his phone. And then when his kid's off with the phone, <laughs> he, the kid and his friends are going through everybody's fracture x-rays. Uh, it didn't go well in the community. So uh, when I found that is really helpful is with burn centers. It's hard to describe a burn on the phone. A picture is, is really great. Um, and the perineums I just keep for myself. <laughs> just, just, just joking. Yeah, yes, let's hope. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Next. What, you want another case? 
Sure. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So we kind of covered now privacy of medical records and privacy of, of photos. Uh, then we can kind of move on into the area of, of honesty, I guess. Uh, lack of honesty uh, gets physicians over and over in liability and malpractice courts. Here's a case, Seward versus Metrolina Medical Associates, <laughs> South Carolina. Uh, this is a man uh, who had been on a trip to Asia with a long flight and he presented with shortness of breath and chest pressure, and his wife came in with him. And the ED chart reflected that he had a cough and shortness of breath. A chest X-ray was done and uh, was negative. So the patient was diagnosed with bronchitis and put on an antibiotic. Of course, the next day he died from a pulmonary embolus. And um, then there was litigation of you missed the diagnosis with classic symptoms and a long plane flight. Um, but then along with that was a claim of falsifying the records um, and saying that the patient was not offered an EKG when they weren't and writing that he had a productive cough when he didn't and examining the calves for DVT, uh, which was not true. And the physician says, I deny all of this. I wrote it right there on the records in the room on my computer while you were there. Uh, but they went back and with an electronic footprint found that he'd done the records later. So he essentially was, um, you know, untruthful on the records and untruthful about when he created the records. And this ended up getting settled for $3 million. You know, I, it's just so stupid to not tell the truth because these days we can catch you. And I'll tell you what, I've never seen cases go so badly is when they think the physician was untruthful because the closing argument is obvious. If he lied about this, did he lie about everything else just to save his butt? And the public expects a higher standard of behavior out of physicians than that. They really do. If you're stupid, they can forgive stupid because they've been stupid too. But lying, they don't want to forget that in my experience. Greg Moore, uh, a jury, do they ha they're basically saying uh, guilty or not guilty, aren't they? Uh, how does the uh, money come into this? Once a uh, person's been declared to be guilty of malpractice, um, the reason I'm asking you this is because there implies that the jury is going to be angry over the fact that this person lied. Not only did they make a misdiagnosis, the outcome would have been the same no matter what. The guy died. Uh, the guy uh, didn't have a thorough enough assessment. Uh, the the uh, doctor made a wrong decision, and the guy died. Then there was added to, to it all of this untruthfulness. How does that react uh, to determining the dollar amounts once the jury has found somebody guilty? Please help me there. You know, I, I, I'm sure it increases it dramatically. Um, lawyers, judges... They love entertainment. They're there for days on end. They love a lawyer to come in and spin a web and tell a tale and try to create an excuse. Uh, but it is a room of honesty and truth, and you're sworn in. And if they find you're dishonest, they bring the hammer down on you. Um, let me let me throw one more case at you that really emphasized that. There was a physician. He was on a visa in the United States. Uh, he had gotten a cardiology fellowship, but um, – before he could do the fellowship, he had to kind of donate a year of service in an impoverished area as a rite of passage. So he worked in the emergency department because we all know anyone can work in the emergency department. Sure. Uh, so uh, he saw a neonate with a fever and did no workup and discharged him and then um, realized the next day after he read Tintin Alley that he should have uh, done a lot more stuff. So he got the chart and changed it and kind of, uh, you know, made it look really nice. In the meantime, the kid was developing meningitis and is uh, non-functional. So then that comes into court and, uh, you know, you find the dishonesty on the chart and the judge awarded $20.3 in this case. Wow. Very, very high award. I'm sure a lot of it was for uh, being dishonest. Yeah, no, I... Uh... <clears throat> I will say this, over the 40-some years I've reviewed cases, 
whenever the physician can be found to have written something down he did not do or said something that they proved to be false, the physician has never won. Doesn't matter what it is. You, he sent the wrong message to 12 citizens picked from the voters' rolls who don't like what you've done. Well, you know, let me express my ignorance here. So the jury finds the person guilty. The uh, amount of the award, how is that determined? So uh, Greg, I mean, Greg might uh, comment on this as well. Uh, but they will also have testimony come in. They will have experts that will give kind of other cases that are similar and what the awards were so the jury can compare to that. They will take a uh, dentist and see how old he is and what he makes and project how many years he would have gone on and then give a, you know, how much did he lose in income kind of thing. Uh, then they kind of say, well, how much is uh, pleasure in your life work? So you have these experts come in and give testimony of the value of different things, and that's presented to the jury as well during the trial. I but always these, love it when they assign a value to the loss of connubial bliss. Uh, yeah. But they do. And, uh, you know, we always think that the expert witnesses in trials are doctors or medical people. No, the, med the economic experts who are usually PhDs, and they will talk about the continuing life care plan. The worst thing is to have this child uh, who's going to live for the next 35 or 40 years and need 24 hour a day care. And what they always give is a range. And so the anger of the jury can be taken out. You can give it the low end of that range or the high end of that range. And I think that, uh, that dishonesty would push that jury and most of us to go to the high end of the range. Wouldn't you say, Greg? Yeah. Yeah. Especially with dishonesty is the term that they use for like, a re you know, having relations is loss of consortium. And so that the spouse can also, uh, receive, you know, um, kind of reimbursement or money for not being able to have relations with their spouse because of this injury. Um, although in some cases they actually take money back because yeah, yeah, they're yeah. better off. Yeah, they've, met, <laughs> they've met my wife. Okay. <laughs> All right. Don't go there, Gregory. Uh, the, uh, but I thought that infants and the elderly were not worth anything when it comes to dollars because the elderly's lives are, their, their ability to, in, to make money, et cetera, et cetera. So this, a $20 million award for an infant, you know, is, uh, seems to be way out of the range of normalcy. Yeah, it is. It is. And, uh, as Greg Henry mentioned, um, it, and it's very, it's, it's just kind of the way it is, but, and it's nothing to be proud of. But if you're going to do malpractice, if someone actually dies, you might be better off from oh, a yeah. defense than a, a child that would have lived 70 years and needs care. The largest 10 verdicts in state of Michigan have been on bad birth cases because not and none of them were kids who died. It's kids who had a loss of chance of having a normal life. And they're able to board, they call it boarding for the jury. They draw out what it's going to cost to take care of that child over uh, the expected range of their life. Uh, you're right, Rick. A 90 year old may not be worth much, but a nine day old who you're going to have to take care of till they're 50 is worth real money. So, so this is a, another thing that I don't, it's sad. Uh, but a lot of times uh, lawyers will not take a case in an elderly malpractice because mm -hmm. they know someone's not going to stand up and say they had $5 million of earning potential left. Um, saying their life isn't worth much uh, is a sad thing to say, but uh, in the world of law, it's kind of true sometimes. Yes, and, and I believe, because we've discussed this before, 
the, the same thing is true of an of an infant. It's a sad thing. The parents are all upset, et cetera, et cetera. But when you get right down to the dollars of it, an infant is not a twenty million dollar case. Normally. Yeah, in general. In general. Yeah. yeah, I bring that case in just to show that when you are uh, dishonest, um, the hammer comes down much harder than you would expect. And and I don't I, I don't know if you guys have ever had a case you weren't proud of, but I've had many. And the urge <laughs> is to go go back to that chart and try to fix it a little bit. And uh, I would encourage you not to do that. Yeah. Well, now with electronic medical records, uh, it's virtually impossible to do uh, anything like that. Yeah. By the way, we, we always found that if someone wants to, in a few days, write down all the details, they date and time their record when they're adding it. It's an addendum report because at least it's honest, even if it's self-serving. And so what they've done is preserve the record, their memory. All of us have bad memories. In five years, you're not going to remember the details again, and it won't be tried for five years. So so basically, when anyone came to me and said, but I've got all this other information, I said, you know what? We sit down, we write it out, we date it and time it and put it in as part of the record. What you don't want to do is make notes that you keep at home for yourself. Right. I, I agree with that totally and completely. And uh, I often go back and amend the record. And the first sentence or two is a statement saying, I understand what the outcome of this was, but I want to write some other things down to preserve for memory uh, that I may not remember later. And on a personal note, when I have these cases, I look up the statute of limitations in my state and I take a beer and I put the patient's label on the beer. And when that date <laughs> arrives for the statute of limitations, I pull that beer out and, and drink it. Yes. Well, <laughs> here on Risk Management Monthly, we do it in bottles of wine. But okay. the, the, the same well, concept holds. Yes. Uh, uh, Greg, you're drinking some very old beer. <laughs> it's really you know, flat. And, and Greg, this may come as a great shock to you, but... People don't have beer cellars. They have wine <laughs> cellars. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Where to next? Well, I, I have another honesty case, or we can move on to something else. Or Oh, honesty oh, is good. Uh, honesty is the best policy. Let's keep on. Okay, this is one where uh, it's a good story for the ER guys. And this is Rogers versus Jackson in Tennessee. A 50-year-old woman comes in with left arm numbness and chest pain. EKG was a little abnormal, nonspecifically. Cardiologist was called and recommended a treadmill in a couple days, and she was discharged. Um, before she had the treadmill, the patient uh, uh, dropped dead. Um, and uh, family sues and says she should have been admitted to the hospital. And the defense of the ED doc was I called the cardiologist and I relied on his expertise and I discharged her based on what he said. The cardiologist said, you know, I never talked to the ER doctor, but if I did talk to him, I would have admitted her. Um, and she uh, should have done the treadmill test in the assigned time. Uh, but they went back to the phone records and the ED docs chart and found that they had talked to the cardiologist and he had recommended discharge. So the cardiologist had lied. And uh, there was a jury verdict in this malpractice case against both physicians that was only against the cardiologist for $970,000. Um, so it was just another example of where a consultant was dishonest and paid the price. So, so nine, 970000 for an adult versus $20 million for the, for the uh, newborn. So yeah. it, it, the life is not fair necessarily. <laughs> You know, the other thing is you're just figuring that out, Rick. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) help me here, Greg. You also mentioned I see in your notes that uh, it it is the uh, unless they've changed it. The AHA says that if you can't do this treadmill right then and there in your hospital, that it ought to be done. I think within 48 hours. Is that isn't that the number that they put on it, or is it 72? I, I, I'm not sure exactly right now. It hadn't been 72. It may be 48. Uh, it's, you know, very, the, it's a very the, short amount of time that, and uh, where you're in this window uh, of safety per the 
Heart Association. I think that, you know, they just pulled that number out of their butt to tell you the truth. But um, the idea of, well, you may have a cardiac problem. Your EKG wasn't quite normal, but we're going to send you home and have you do a treadmill test, which is has a sensitivity of about 70 percent. I just exactly. don't get it. I just no. don't get it. <laughs> Rick, this is old science, and uh, at your hospital, if you seriously entertain uh, the possibility that this is advanced cardiac disease, do not think that a treadmill test is the way to rule that out. It isn't anymore. I don't even think we have one at, at our local hospital anymore. They they go to the chest pain unit. If their enzymes are, are clear, they don't bump, they cath them. It, Hey, listen, man. We don't call them enzymes anymore. You're giving your age away for Christ. Yeah. They're called they're called markers. 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 Yeah. Okay. That's right. <laughs> and right. there is a treadmill machine somewhere in that hospital because they do these thallium treadmills. You know, which is uh, much more uh, uh, specific at finding out. You know, these areas of um, imperfusion kind of thing. Yeah. So they only miss twenty percent of the of it's the some, people with disease like that. Exactly. instead of thirty. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Moving on, Greg. Sure. Let's go to a different area. And uh, this is one that you can kind of fall into the trap. You know, you're uh, you've just worked your 12th night shift in a row or you're feeling tired or things aren't going well in your life. And you, we all have periods where we get a little cynical and and start to view the patient sometimes as the enemy a little bit. And I want to give a couple cases that kind of caution you to not fall into that trap. Um, to maintain your professionalism and courtesy. First case is Young versus Women's Health, South Carolina. And here's a 37-year-old, and she applies for a life insurance policy, and they grab her medical records. And on her OBGYN notes, there's a mention that the patient uh, had substance abuse. And so the life insurance policy was denied based on substance abuse. And so then she actually litigates against the OBGYN doctor because there was no history of that. The doctor had just heard about it and wrote about it, and she didn't get her policy. And here there was a jury verdict for $1.5 million. So mm. which I, I guess the, the economic things on that is how big would the policy have been and so forth and so on. But I just think it's a good case to caution you not to write down things that you don't know are true. Because uh, it came back to bite this physician. So, Greg, what would you do in this case? Would you carry on conversation yourself with the patient to confirm or deny this? Because it is a part of their medical history. We can't we can't say it's not. How should we handle this? Yeah, it's hard to write down everything that would protect you. I guess you could write that. Uh, you know, there was an alleged <laughs> alleged substance abuse, but not confirmed. Or, uh, you know, I guess the, probably the best thing would to be to honestly, um, you know, have an interaction with the patient. And if the if they deny it, then uh, then you could honestly write on your chart the patient denied it. And if they did do it, and the insurance company found out, that would be on <clears throat> the patient on the patient for lying to you rather than you writing something you didn't really know. Yeah, that's right, and. Uh, into the in the rules of evidence in law, there is an exception to the federal rules that says that what a doc, patient says to the doctor is not hearsay. They can actually use that in court. So it's the hearsay exception. If they tell you something, it is assumed that the patient said that for their benefit in their health care, and so is usually admitted into evidence. Yeah. And, and then I always look at the, you know, we have the soap note. The S is subjective. That's what they told you. You don't yeah. know whether it's true or not. Um, likewise, in the history, any history is what they tell you, and you're not going to be held accountable for what they tell you. They are. Right. Correct. Yeah. So I got another case here. Uh, Mayhew versus Madison in Kentucky. And this is a 30-year-old woman who comes to the emergency department. She's complaining of pelvic pain and a vaginal discharge. And she thought she might be pregnant. For some reason, the physician did a drug screen and it was positive for barbiturates. 
Of course, we all know that drug screens are notoriously, they, you know, different substances cross over and give you positives. Uh, the patient was asked, you know, do you do barbiturates? And the patient said, I don't do barbiturates. I don't know why that would be positive. And then she got upset and she left the emergency department. And so the ED physician um, discovered that she'd had several past prescriptions for narcotics and labeled her as a drug seeker. Well, right after she left, she, he called the police and said she had been in there seeking drugs. And as she drove away, she was arrested by the police and taken to jail. So later, uh, charges were dismissed, and she had a diagnosis of endometriosis and surgery for endometriosis. So she sued the emergency physician and said, you know, you called the police. You shared personal information. I had a disease. I had a reason to get pain medicine. Um, but you went after me and got me arrested. And, um, you know, this went to trial. And uh, interesting enough, during trial, be aware, these lawyers are sharp. They're going to go after everything. The lawyers found that the physician had been arrested for a DUI in the past. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's the kettle calling the pot black. And in this one, there was a jury verdict for 125000 so, You know, if I, if I was the... Uh plaintiff's counsel, that doctor on cross-examination where you're allowed to lead the witness, he could be led right into a trap because uh, you are allowed to ask questions about things which may challenge his view or opinion of the case. And to, and to say, doctor, I'd like you to read your arrest report from this date. Uh, you know, that, that, that could be a tremendously, uh, uh, telling thing to a jury that, so this, this kettle is calling this pot black. He's been pulled over for a DUI. He doesn't know that this woman is actually impaired at the time. You know, I can see where there'd be some, uh, after all, everybody on the jury has somebody in the family who you, abuses drugs or drinks, everybody. And you could see how you could stir up a jury on a case like that. You know, for a doctor to turn somebody in, call the police, he better have some evidence she's impaired to the point where she constitutes a danger to the general public at that moment in time. Now, we, we've all done that, but boy, in this case, it doesn't sound like there's very much to call the police about. So so the this case is it's just, you know, we often have an urge to be vindictive uh, or label or categorize people. And I would try to maintain your professionalism and not go there because you're not going to win anything. Um, which, you know, just try not to get in that uh, pitfall of viewing a patient as an enemy. Well, it, it just it doesn't come out well. We've not been appointed the social police. And uh, so if, if you keep to objective things, the patient is impaired to the point where they can't function. That's a different kind of question than, than, than demonizing their lifestyle just because you don't like it. Right, exactly. And I guess I'll bring up a point here, too, that's kind of uh, – uh, kind of makes you scared. And that is a lot of these kind of areas that we've been discussing, they're not necessarily medical malpractice. And your insurance policy may not cover you for this kind of stuff. You're going to come out of your own uh, savings with it. Yes, exactly. And, you know, having written uh, policies for two companies, there are very specific things we covered and all kinds of things we did not cover. And if you think you're going to get malpractice coverage in a case like that, it would depend on how the uh, th the charges were arranged. But uh, I could see that one being easily denied by the insurance company. Greg, where are we now? You We've want to got, keep going? Yes, please. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. I tell you, we got lots of time. Okay. Great. Well, here's another one uh, along the lines of professionalism uh, is uh, listen to the patient. Listen to the patient. We know that helps us make diagnoses. 
uh, but it also helps us avoid being liable in certain situations. Um, so take the time to listen to a patient and and give uh, credence to what they have to share with you. Here, here's a case I have. Uh, it's a, an OBGYN case. It's AG versus Group Health in Washington. And we've all had this before, but a 34-year-old woman, uh, she suffered a sexual assault when she was in college. So for the rest of her life, she didn't want any male physicians doing uh, pelvic exams on her. So she's pregnant. She comes into labor, goes into labor, and uh, shoulder dystocia develops during the labor. Now, when she checked into the hospital, she says to the staff, I don't want anyone doing a pelvic on- exam on me that's a male. But when she has this shoulder dystocia, they call for a physician, and it's a male, and he comes in and does what he needs to do. Um, But then later she sues and says, I did not want a male, you know, uh, examining my pelvis, um, and you did, and therefore I'm litigating. And there was a jury verdict in this for $270,000 and $45,000 more for the husband's loss of consortium. So just uh, it was a humbling case of, you know, listen to people. Although, you know, the uh, inference is that uh, they could have had a female physician come in there and do that. Uh, There may have been some, uh, obviously this case, the jury said you got to pay, but uh, it, 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 sounds like it could have been a stretch, frankly. The guy may be coming in there and trying to help out, and, and uh, the outcome is good, and he gets kicked in the shins. Right, and then, and then I think a lot of like a case like this, a lot of it is the gamesmanship of the lawyering. I mean, if you present it to a jury like, well, gee, I was there. She needed help. I helped her. I'm sorry if I didn't get this uh, compliance with this one issue. I'm just glad that we have a live baby. You know, it's it, a lot of it's how you present it to the jury. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yep. So. You know, we've 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 certainly had this uh, question over the years here on Risk Management Monthly, and do what you think is right at that moment in time. And pretty much twelve people um, are probably going to side with you. <laughs> they, I think most juries would like to not punish doctors for something like that stepping in during a difficult situation. I mean, I think I, I think that the way the lawyering goes, I, I don't know why this guy lost, but that's too bad. Yeah, but the message r- really is listen to patients, and if they say, I don't want this, uh, be careful about going ahead and ignoring them and doing it. All right, another case. This one's uh, a little different, uh, and this is how you treat other people around you. And we've all been around kind of abusive consultants uh, uh, and vice versa uh, in the workplace. And uh, this is a case, uh, Race versus Dosher in Indiana. And this is a basically a hospital uh, operating room worked for a CV surgeon. And he was a perfusionist, excuse me. <clears throat> and um, Basically, uh, this surgeon didn't like this perfusionist, and he would constantly say, uh, you know, how bad he was. Uh, He was an idiot. He didn't know what he was doing. He was incompetent. And then one day it came to a head, and the surgeon actually charged towards the perfusionist, uh, clenching his fist, kind of had a beet red face and popping veins in his neck and screaming and swearing at him. Um, The perfusionist said I had to back up against the wall and hold my hands up, and then he basically litigated against that surgeon for workplace bullying, and the jury awarded him $325,000. So this is is kind of an extreme case, but the message here on professionalism is just be nice to your coworkers as well. Well, you know, this this goes back to we all entered medicine, I guess – 50 years ago or so for Rick and I, Count Med School. Um, And the behavior was unbelievable in those days. Everybody saw that bull surgeon who threw instruments, who yelled, who did this and that. None of that's allowed anymore. This is making, uh, and the term that all these lawyers are using is the hostile work environment. You're not allowed I mean, you're perfectly allowed, if you think somebody's wrong, to pull them aside and say, you know, I think we ought to do this or that. 
if you're throwing a tantrum, if you're throwing a hissy fit, uh, and embarrassing or demeaning employees, um, just understand nobody's putting up with that anymore. And uh, it's not the way to go. Yeah, the behavior our, has changed. Our hospital made it very clear to all the members of the medical staff that uh, if they crossed a line on this, that they would be uh, brought up between and uh, and more likely than not dismissed from the medical staff that this was not going to be tolerated. It also made the employees very um, comfortable knowing that this has been put out in the open, that uh, bad behavior on anybody's part, we don't care who you are, uh, will be um, not tolerated. All right, let's we want to switch to another one. This one hits close to home. Uh, I'm not going to give you specific cases. I see it over and over and over. Um, but one that's hit close to me was uh, a former resident that we trained um, who had had books written about their prior life for being such an amazing story. Um, they had they were one of the orphans that was airlifted out of Vietnam and were adopted and then went on to be a doctor and then emergency medicine specialist. Um, but then uh, it was all over the press. They got arrested uh, in a hotel room with a 17 year old and further research showed that the physician had been prescribing um, drugs for sex. And I see this over and over and over and you say, well, it wouldn't be me or anybody that, you know, was uh, a decent or good physician. But for me, I've had one now that I trained uh, that was an outstanding person with an amazing life story uh, that fell into this trap. Um, and so I would caution everyone because there will be temptations from people you know to write for things that you shouldn't, and they can uh, easily fall into a barter situation. And please don't go there. Yes. Oh, I, I over the years I had four physicians who we had to let go for these exact same reasons. And uh, you know, whenever you see somebody who's writing for fifty Vicodin tablets. There's something wrong <laughs> out of an emergency department. You don't need 50 Vicodin or per uh, Percocet tablets. And every time that came up and we kind of called them on it, this was the situation. And you know what? It never does anybody any good. Um, just stay away from it. It's, you know, it's not the way to go. We have a 35 or 40 year career. And frankly, that career is worth a lot of money. And to prematurely destroy that career <clears> by one um, thoughtless interaction or transaction is is just tragic. It's just tragic, um, especially in this case where you're talking about, Greg, where this guy came from Vietnam and had all of these challenges and still rose above them uh, to become uh, a good uh, doctor, at least technically. Um, once these things occur, getting your license back, depending on the state in which you uh, practice, can be uh, a extraordinarily difficult, if at all, achievable. Yeah, and that, and that just uh, kind of a recent news things, but the the physician that got dragged off that United flight had had his license suspended for the the same thing, prescribing uh, drugs for sex, uh, in the past. So really it's, yep. it's pervasive. Yeah. His yeah, was we, not, his was not with the girl <laughs> though. His actually was with a boy <laughs> prescribing drugs for sex. So, well, let me just tell you there are a lot of things at a slightly lower level. It's when you're writing them from your brother-in-law, you're writing them for this or that your neighbors, all these sorts of things, just stay out of it. Because everyone's looking, by the way, today, uh, actually it was yesterday it came in, the new rules for the state of Michigan with regard to physicians and opiates came out. And if you think there's any sense of humor here, huh. there's none. And what they've done is they've taken a problem uh, and they think they found somebody to blame. That's us. That's the problem. We're the bad guys. What they've done is to try and get the three or four percent of the bozos 
they've made it harder for the 96 or 97 percent to handle these cases. But it's the way it is. And uh, you know what? I'm glad I'm at this end of my career because I prescribed over all those years, you know, probably 10 tablets to people, you know, for two to three days till they got in to be rechecked. It's even hard to do that these days without checking the three states around you to look at their what they call their their automated uh, systems to make sure they're not getting prescriptions from someplace else. I, I think it's all gone crazy myself, but uh, who knows? Rick, you got feelings about this. Yeah, speaking of uh, that topic, uh, it, it is making my blood boil. And have you seen blood boil? It's not a good thing to see. Not a good you know, thing, no. <laughs> you know, all of this is like we're going to limit access. We're, they've, <clears throat> pardon me, they've told the drug companies to make less of these pills available. So uh, uh, that will make uh, the inferences that there'll be less out in the community because there's less uh, uh, available to prescribe. The, uh, the the thing is, everybody's being told, use less, more more Tylenol, more ibuprofen. Uh, these drugs are similar. They're, they're not similar. And the idea here is uh, a, a great study was done uh, recently by um, actually Dave Schreiger was one of the uh, one of the uh, authors on it, where they looked at um, a database uh, of uh, use of drugs in California. The top five percent of prescribers prescribe 30 percent of all the opiate prescriptions. And those 30 percent of the opiate prescriptions represented 49 percent of total morphine milligram equivalents. So the top five percent are, are, are huge prescribers. It's kind of like, guys, it's kind of obvious where you ought to take a look. Uh, when they looked at the people who were episodic prescribers, like emergency physicians, uh, they were responsible for less than 9% of the opiate prescriptions in the state of California and less than 3% of the morphine milligram equivalents prescribed. That's us. We're the 3% guys. Yeah, and, see, that's and, the question. No, it's not how many scripts you give out. It's for how long those scripts last. You and I are three and four day pain people. We're not six months worth of medications on a script. I think all of this pressure to get doctors to write less opiates is, is going to hurt patients. First of all, we don't prescribe them when we don't think people need them. I, I, I think that that's pretty straightforward. Uh, right now we're being pushed to not prescribe them when people do need them. We don't describe, prescribe too many. You're right, Greg. We're talking about two, three, four days at most. And we rarely, if ever, prescribe these long acts. I've never written an Oxycontin prescription in my entire life. Nope. So it's, it's like, leave us alone. Leave us alone. We, we know what we're doing. We're not going to be making an, anybody an addict. We're not going to prescribe too long. And stop putting all of these limits on us making us the bad guys. What they really ought to consider doing is, if you want to try to fix this problem, how about some treatment? There is a treatment known that works, Soboxone. Have you guys heard about Soboxone? This yes. is the, this yes. is the stuff that uh, basically you take. It is a narcotic, but it doesn't give you the same high. It's a pill, so you get it by prescription. So you, it's not like taking methadone where you have to go to a methadone place every day. This is a tremendous opportunity that is not being um, taken advantage of by the doctors in this country. There's um, of the 800,000 doctors in this country, 44,000 of them have the special um, status to be able to prescribe Soboxone. And, and frankly, it, they make it difficult. You have to an eight, take an eight hour class. All physicians have to take an eight hour class to prescribe this stuff. They'll put an they add an X to the end of your DEA number. You can only prescribe it for 30 people in your first year. Thereafter, you can prescribe it for 100. PAs and NPs can, t uh, can prescribe this stuff now, but they have to have a 24-hour class in the, uh, in the use of this stuff. 
uh, they this these are reasonable alternatives to allow people to take drugs that will modify their desire for um, other narcotics and which will allow them to work and and be in society and not have to go to a place that th these methadone clinics basically just hardly exist. So I, I, I'm pissed. I'm pissed. Um, and the data basically su suggests that we should be left alone. Yeah. And what what uh, what's ironic is that you know ten or fifteen years ago, uh, we had these mandated pain scales and we were obligated to respond to them, and administrators were hammering us if you didn't get rid of their pain. <laughs> and here we are; the pendulum has definitely swung. Well, listen, yeah. can I just read one uh, newsletter I, I got here? It says HCA warns patients that they will quote will feel pain, quote, in an effort to curb our uh, opiate use. So they're basically telling their patients, expect to feel pain because we're going to back off on the use of these opiates. When it's like, what kind of message is that? We are one of the few people who can take care of pain. We don't need new drugs. We just need a mentality. So the pendulum is going to swing, and they're going to say uh, – uh, Pain is no longer the fifth vital signs. The uh, Joint Commission is being sued for pushing that concept on us, and they're suing everybody they can think of uh, to blame somebody for this problem. Yep. Um, <clears throat> by the way, while we're talking about things that sort of get our goat and make us mad, there is at least a new uh, standard of care ruling out of Michigan which has to do with the time a doctor has to spend in a specialty to say he's part of a specialty. You know, under the Daubert decisions, um, <clears throat> you have to be an expert in that field. But some doctors were claiming to have expertise in internal medicine, emergency medicine, PD, all these various things. Now the Michigan decision is, you get to have one area of expertise, and you, that's where you'd be better be spending the majority of your time, or they're not going to let you get on the stand. You know, that was a, that's a great decision for the doctors in Michigan. I hope the rest of the states carry on with that, but it's, uh, it, it really is a good way to go. Uh, you guys may be hearing a little noise in the background. I should, should not have turned on my printer, uh, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. It, this should be over in about uh, half an hour. <laughs> no, <Yeah>. no. <laughs> about, about, about 30 seconds. Um, so if you would bear with me, we're, we're, I'm, wanna, I'm cranking out some notes uh, that I wanted to cover uh, about some cases and some articles, and I could better read them when they're printed out. And I should have done this in advance, and I truly am sorry. Well, let me, while you're waiting for those to be printed out, ask uh, Greg Moore a couple other questions. We've, sure. got, we've got somebody who has written to us. We actually, there's two or three people who are very lonely here in the country who uh, actually write to Rick and I. We're, we're grateful for it. But he asks this question. I um, want to discuss the fact, is it the standard of care or what do you know about the standard of care? for missing an occult hip fracture on the first visit. Now, Rick and I both responded to this physician uh, who was asked not to have their name used, so we'll respect that. But the, the bottom line, I said, I've testified in two cases where this became an issue, but in both cases, the patient had significant other injuries which required the emergency physician to be busy with those injuries. And each one of us has looked at a hip x-ray at some point in the past, not in the MRI era, I don't think, but some point in the past and haven't seen the initial fracture. I don't know, Greg, do you have any experience with this sort of thing? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's all gonna be case by case, facts by fact uh, basis. And what you convinced the jury was was reasonable in the situation. So, like, if the if the 
fracture was evident on the x-ray, then that makes it a lot more difficult to defend, right? Because right. You, you ordered a test for a reason, and then you should have used the test and used it properly. Um, but if it's not visible on the x-ray, which we know a lot of them aren't, um, you know, I would think that would be much easier and likely uh, defendable. You know, you're not obligated to pick up everything. Uh, a good lawyer would uh, probably show that, you know, the percentage of these that are not found on the first visit. And I bet many, many, many of them are not found. I'll just give you a, an example of this. I, I had a kid that was four years old about 15 years ago that uh, ended up having appendicitis. I saw the child. They came back the next day. They had a perforated appendix. Um, I talked to the pediatric surgeon who, uh, this was a referral hospital. He did every pediatric appy in the entire city of Indianapolis. He told me, I've never operated on a four-year-old that wasn't perforated. Uh, so he said the standard of care in a four-year-old with appendicitis is perforation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, whenever we look at all of these cases like uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage cases, you know, the standard is to miss it the first two visits. Right. And, and is it unfortunate? Yes. But the bottom line is, we're not going to be perfect on all those things, right. and and physicians aren't required to be perfect. They're required to be reasonable. Exactly. Hey guys, can I go back to the uh, case and the article that I had mentioned, where uh, the database of drug use in California was checked out by Dave Schrager? The 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 first author on that paper is a uh, Todd Schneeber. Todd is uh, currently a UCLA fellow, but is going to be the residency. Uh, associate director at USC beginning in June. So uh, we're going to be getting to interact with him. And he is um, very much concerned about uh, the pendulum swinging too far as well. And sh and his study was the one that demonstrated that we're giving out virtually none of the narcotics in this state of California and that there are some big fish that people ought to, ought to be looking for. Well, as you remember, Rick, when we did the Tug Valley case, that one uh, pharmacy hooked up with that one clinic had put out two million tablets or something like that over five years. I mean, the state shouldn't have any trouble picking up where the problem is. I, th I think that uh, to say that uh, we're the center of this is just is just crap. It's it's not it's not going. But anywhere. but you but you have to realize, virtually everything we're hearing is about limiting use and access, so that physicians are being you know the uh, the screws are being put to physicians, and so the word is out, and we're going to demonize these drugs, when in fact that's really not what we be, should be doing. In fact, let me read the conclusion of their paper. Interventions focused on reducing opiate prescriptions in the episodic care setting are unlikely to yield important reductions in the prescription opioid supply. Conversely, targeting the high quantity prescribers has the potential to create substantial reductions. It's kind of straightforward and pretty obvious, um, but I don't like this idea of the only way they're focusing on this is limiting limiting access, limiting amount, limiting number, so many days, that kind of thing. That's not where the action is. No, and and a kid with who comes off the football field with, with a swollen knee and uh, extreme pain when you move it, you know, ice bags and, and some uh, narcotics for three days didn't turn that kid into an addict. Addiction is a complex process. It's not relieving pain for a couple of days. And if we think that's the case, that, you know, if the government's going to put that on us, the onus on us, then I don't know what we're going to do. Because there are people who genuinely need pain taken away. And, you know, I, I my favorite opioid is morphine. It's simple. It's straightforward. I understand it. I've been giving it out for years. I don't think I've ever made an addict uh, with a shot of morphine in the department for somebody who had a real 
<laughs> obvious cause for pain. Oh yeah, that's not the issue. The issue is these prescriptions that are written and that how long, how many, those kinds of things. Um, those are where we, where they want to limit us. Um, but let's get back to legal issues. Uh, Greg Moore, anything uh, more in your uh, quiver? Well, I have a, I have a, I have a couple cases on a topic that I'll share with you, and then if you want, I have a couple of. Uh, more for entertainment, audacious cases, if you want those at the end. But uh, the next two, I'll, I'll give them in, in succession. Um, and they just center on uh, being careful when you do uh, personal exams. Um, it, you know, I see it litigated over and over and over. Uh, I will say that usually they are defense verdicts. Um, but if you can do the right thing and avoid the court case, you're thousands of dollars ahead. The thing about malpractice is you just don't want to get in court in the first place because you've already lost. You've lost time and you've lost money. But this case is Alta Murano versus Dexter in Texas. It's a 41-year-old woman, began to have or, or kind of had chronic back pain, uh, had a chiropractor to talk, uh, done a bunch of different maneuvers. But there was a maneuver, it's it you go into the rectum and you do intra-rectal coccygeal adjustment. It's very recognized. He did that on her. She claimed that uh, you know that he anally raped her and um, didn't do informed consent. <clears throat> this went to court and he got a defense verdict. Um, another case is Robertson versus Cooper in California. A 31-year-old woman, she went to see a, a, a doctor in the ED. Um, and um, she claimed that the when the kind of medical assistant left the room that the physician uh, abused her on the pelvic exam and he denied the charges and the medic had uh, basically documented that they were in the room and there was no abuse going on. The physician had documented it and it was a defense case. But I just kind of want to warn people that uh, when you go to do these rectal and pelvic exams, the importance of a chaperone. Uh, to document uh, that, that there was nothing funny going on that's going to get you off labor if there is litigation. Um, and also, you know, when you're going to do a personal or unusual exam to solicit the agreement of the patient, hey, I need to do this exam, is that okay? And then document that they uh, kind of were asked and accepted. Over my career, we had uh, two times a young woman come out of the examining room and said that doctor um manipulated by breasts in a sexual way one guy uh was not going to put up with this we fought this thing all the way through to the end come to find out this woman had done this in four other states and had settled for various amounts of money i mean we had this come to us when she filed a police report and then said to us for $50,000, maybe I was wrong. You know what? There, you're right. Have somebody in the room. Don't make it a debate. Uh, just, just make it the way it is. And I don't care who's in the room, but have somebody else there. Yeah, this is something that needs to be a departmental policy. Mm -hmm. This is not something that you should be deciding on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there's just too much risk in this uh, in this day and age. Greg, I think it's but, time for you to do. Uh, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Greg. I just want to uh, finishing up on that. Uh, don't let sex be a factor, uh, you know, in that as well, because, uh, you know, a male will make a claim against a male. And, a you know, a lot of times you'll see uh, a female physician say, well, I'm going to do the pelvic. I don't need a chaperone. I'm a female. Uh, but be careful of going there because it happens both ways. Yeah, I agree exactly. 100%. Everybody needs a chaperone. We don't care what sexes are involved. Uh, Greg, you want to do uh, some wine of the month? I think yes. we're there now. Yeah, I'm going to do some wine of the month, but I, I've got to read something to our listeners, which is the damnedest crap I've ever heard. You and I, we always think, well, doctors don't. You know, they make up a lot of stuff. I want you to listen to this description by a critic who I value, where she describes this wine as a scent of blackberries, black cherries, mulberries, hints of cigar box, 
and dry herbs and fragrant earth. I I defy anyone to do an inner an inner rater variable here a k that's what we call it the kappa that this is what they're going to say when it comes out it's unbelievable by the way it's on a wine that i like it's anderson's con valley 2015 cabernet sauvignon napa valley and it's fairly reasonable 49 bucks a bottle <laughs> but 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 when i read this description i thought how can people honestly believe that they sense all these things? It's the damnedest crap I ever heard in my life. However, I do like the wine I suggested. Anderson's Con Valley, uh, Napa Valley 2015. Thanks. Okay, guys, I think we've got to wrap it up here. Uh, Greg Moore, thanks so much for bringing these cases uh, to our attention and your expertise <laughs> And uh, Gregory, as usual, it's been uh, fun uh, to have you uh, participate as well. Uh, we're signing off for now. Talk with you next month. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>